Good morning from London. I'm Kriti Gupta alongside Guy Johnson and Oliver Crook. We're an hour away from the opening trade. Here's what you need to know. Hopes for a soft landing grow in the United States with attention turning to the Fed's preferred inflation gauge later today. Meanwhile, here in Europe, we get the latest CPI numbers from France and the Eurozone. German fringe parties take center stage in regional elections over the weekend, heaping pressure on the chancellor, while France still awaits a new prime minister. And over in the States, Kamala Harris gives her first TV interview as Democratic nominee as she gains momentum in the most consequential swing states, according to Bloomberg's latest polls. We're going to dive into the details. Ollie. Thanks so much, Kriti. Yeah, let's close out this week with Eurostox futures down just about one-tenth of a percent the last day of trading here as we head into the cash open. Wanted to look at China up here today. The CSI 300 catching a bid 2% up. That is after the Chinese government allegedly will begin to allow refinancing of $5.4 trillion worth of mortgages as the real estate sector creaks. Bid uh, also being caught here on uh, Brent, breaking up uh, between 80 and the euro dollar. There we go. A little bit of action. Slightly green ahead of that CPI data that we get in the next few hours. The countdown to the opening trade starts right now. Friday the 30th, good morning. Welcome to the show. NVIDIA now in the rear view mirror. We've got a U.S. holiday. It's Labor Day Monday in the United States. It is going to be closed. Friday, what's going to provide the catalyst? Could it be the inflation data we get on both sides of the Atlantic? We could kick it off here in Europe, but we're going to get core PCE a little later on out of the United States. Could that be the catalyst we're looking for on the last trading day of the month, Ollie Crook? Yeah, that's right. I mean, let's just recap what we're expecting out of the Eurozone. 2.2 percent inflation. Again, that will probably not change the conversation too much for the September uh, rate cut. That seems more or less priced in. Obviously, we will get basically almost 100 percent confirmation of that after we get the numbers from the Eurozone, from France, from Italy today. We're yep. expecting it to come down across the board. I do wonder, however, on France, will there be a sort of Olympic uh, question in terms of pricing there? We saw that a little bit on the PMI services, a little yep. bit upside surprise. But I think what's interesting is we also heard from Nagel overnight basically talking about not the September, but the rate path forward. So I wonder how much the debate at the ECB is really about that now, uh, beginning with the price, being, everything being priced in for September. Yeah, and we should also mention in the last 24 hours, German inflation came in much softer, or I think below the ECB target, right? Below that key 2% yeah, 1 uh, target. Yeah, 1.9%. Well, yeah, I mean, there were two, but then there's, there's the, uh, the harmonizes 2%, but then another gauge below 2%. So, yeah. yeah. So, so positive news there for Germany, getting in on, on the gains that you're seeing in, in the periphery, at least. Uh, we should also mention we got some UK numbers crossing the wire, as, as well as nationwide house prices falling 0.2% month over month. The estimate was a gain of 0.2%. When are we going to see the effect maybe of lower rates coming through? The real question we're in the UK is, are lower rates going to be coming through? Yeah. And there's been a lot of caution this time around from the Bank of England. The, the contrast between Andrew Bailey and Powell at Jackson Hole I thought was really stunning. Bailey's being really cautious in terms of where he thinks rates are going to go. The standout story from this month, I think, in terms of the bond market, particularly at the front end, has been the big move, the big bid you've seen into the front end of the US curve. But the big sell-off you've seen in the UK curve, so front-end yeah. UK gilts have actually sold off this month. So maybe actually this, this expectation that lower rates are going to provide some sort of catalyst for the housing market is going to be maybe uh, we, we need to be disabused of that idea. You look at completions in the housing market as well, that tells you actually the shortage is going to continue. The labour market is going to really, sorry, the Labour Party is going to really struggle to push that story on and provide more house building in the UK. So the UK housing market, I think, is really interesting right now. The UK rates market, I think, is fascinating. The Bank of England, much more cautious, maybe, in terms of what is happening here. But the UK, in some ways, Oli feels like uh, an area of stability, Critty, yeah. <laughs> relative to everywhere else, the United States and Europe. Does that, does that stick around, though? We don't, don't really know. know. I I'm mean, that, that seems to be the move in, in, in cable. But, but sticking with the housing conversation that we're talking about, at least in the U.K., arguably in the U.S., this was a key part of, over in the States, the, the policies around the election. Kamala Harris coming out in her very first televised interview uh, since becoming the presumptive, well, not presumptive anymore, she is the Democratic nominee. I should say I'm so used to saying that. But I think it's crucial that in her interview, she really talked about how she's going to make things more affordable. Top of the agenda was actually housing. Take a listen to what she had to say. My agenda includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries, for example, dealing with an issue like price gouging, what we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years, what we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. 
Can we point out the fact that whoever takes uh, office in, in 2025 uh, will be getting the benefit from a potential easing cycle in, in the states? And some of that is going to most quickly show up in the housing uh, story, which whoever the next president is, whether it's Kamala Harris, whether it's Donald Trump, is going to take a lot of credit for. Maybe. The stock market might get down there. Um, if you take a look at what is happening, in, so, so the CBOE has brought forward some of the options so people can trade around the election. So that is now in place, so people can now position for that. And the, the sense seems to be in terms of the options pricing, and you're seeing this on both sides of the Atlantic, is you're going to see a downside move in the stock market, almost regardless of who wins. Yeah. So the Trump-Harris trade is kind of on, but the sense seems to be that the stock market goes down. So you benefit from... From the housing market, maybe showing signs of, of some positivity. Yeah. But if you get a big move down in the stock market, and remember, Trump has in the past judged himself on how the stock market performs. And I think a lot of people have uh, also judged Trump on how the stock market has performed. You know? Yeah. Um, so I think that that's but he's also, still seen yeah. within polling as being better for the stock market. Yeah. Certainly. Um, and I think I mean I mean I think it's interesting. I mean again I mean did we get with this interview with Kamala Harris? Did we get more policy versus platitudes? I think it's a little bit hard to say. I mean I, li <laughs> I mean I listened to it. I, she's not going to ban fracking. That was concrete. You know. Yep. It, extending some of the policies that are in there. But again, I think it's still pretty light, and I wonder how much of a sort of risk that is as you get closer to the election and people start to hear things they don't, uh, they don't like, th yeah. that lead could be eroded very quickly. It absolutely could, and it kind of almost feels like Harrisonomics goes one step forward uh, further than Bidenomics in terms of price gouging conversation. The fracking piece I thought was interesting. This is, oil is one of the United States' largest exports. So this is, of course, a hard uh, topic that affects a lot of the southern economies, of course, in the states. Yep. Uh, the other piece I thought was interesting is that she actually had a little bit of a tough stance on, on on the border, and this is a key voting issue, but it's also a key economic issue as well. There was a Goldman note off the back of the revisions that we got in the labor market, the 818,000 number uh, that we got that kind of spooked the market, but then kind of didn't. Goldman saying that that number was largely because people aren't reporting and people being uh, corporations aren't reporting um, the immigration numbers that are being uh, included in their labor force. So they're not actually reporting that certain employees are either immigrants or contracted workers or, or whatever that is, and that's what's showing up in the data. She's certainly taking a tougher tough stance in that area. It's interesting as well, and Anna Fracking, it's interesting she's also talking about putting a Republican in the cabinet. She doesn't name who, but she's talking about putting a Republican in the candidate. Maybe trying to reach into the centre again. To your point, Ollie, though, if she doesn't come up with policies, why will the, why will the undecideds vote for her? Mm. Do they need a reason to vote for her? And I think that's interesting. But it's interesting that the latest polling is certainly yeah. continuing the honeymoon. And I think it's interesting that this question of immigration also takes us to one of our other top stories Germany. today. Yeah, I mean, so Germany and France are both interesting. You think about what is happening there in terms of that immigration story. Germany, obviously, is going to be the one that we're going to watch out for this weekend. You're going to be back in Berlin very shortly. This weekend's key votes in the east. The AFD is polling really strongly. The incumbents aren't. How big a shock is that going to be this weekend? How big a kind of... Is this going to be akin to the French earthquake that we've just seen in sort of coming out of Paris? Are we going to see something similar in Berlin? Yeah, so I think it's interesting to disentangle these two things. There is a question of AFD far-right strength within these regions, right? There is a question yeah. also of that... And that strength may be mitigated by the fact that there is this new far-left party. And the sort of politics, the horseshoe of politics, with yeah. the far-right and the far-left, they overlap on two issues. On one, it's immigration. On the second, it's support for Ukraine. They do not want to do it. They want to end the war. They're more sort of seen as pro-Russia. The question is then this also this other question of the weakness of the coalition government. We're expecting basically single digit returns percentage wise for each member of this coalition. Some of them may drop out of the local parliament. Concretely, it will make it a little bit harder to pass laws if you have more extremes. But also there's a big conversation about next year. Is Schultz the right man to lead the SPD into the federal election that happens next year? I think that's a debate that starts to open. And we're still having a budget conversation that comes alongside that. I think there was a part of the budget agreement was decided in, I want to say, July, but that still has some, some tweaking and some shaking out to do. We've got some great guests coming up. We're going to be talking about all of these subjects throughout the program. Wellington's Paul Skinner is going to join us shortly. Is the market complacent? The bond market is signaling a recession. The equity market is signaling a soft landing. Can both be right? Otto Fricker will outline what the story is in East Germany. These upcoming state elections are so important. So we'll be joined by a member of the FDP. Um, Oli just talking about the impact of what we could see in terms of the coalition. We're going to be talking volatility with Unicredit, Silvio Ivano, and then we're going to wrap European inflation data. Imogen Bakker is going to be joining us from NatWest a little bit later on. Is that inflation data 
going to be the catalyst today? Well, it sounds like it. Let's just lay it out for you, because at 10 a.m. UK time, of course, we get the Italy and Euro area CPI numbers. We're going to break, I think, the French inflation numbers uh, throughout this program this morning before we even get to that. But really, it feels like the focus is over in the States, especially when it comes to the Fed's next moves. They seem to have boxed themselves in a little bit of a corner, that a cut is in the cards in September. Does the PCE data today, 1.30 uh, p.m. UK time, uh, which will be about 8.30 uh, a.m. U.S. time, and the labor uh, numbers that we get next week, was that going to sway some of that? Plus, we also get the UMISH uh, consumer sentiment numbers today, also at 3 p.m. UK time. I, f- I feel like Powell's put the, the Fed in the same place that Lagarde put the ECB in earlier on this year with that first rate cut. It's like it was so strongly signaled you, they had to deliver upon it. Mm. And you've got this labor market data next week with the payroll number. If that comes yeah. through strong, th- does that kind of call into question whether or not this first cut should come at that point? Yeah. I don't know. It just it feels like he's uh, he boxed himself into a corner, boxed the Fed into a corner in terms yeah. of that cut. But also, and, and we have a ton of data, and it does feel like it's going to be still a waiting game because we do have that Labor Day holiday on Monday, so it just feels yep. like it's going to be a little bit calm. Not so much in Europe, though. We do still have that informal uh, meeting, I believe, uh, that's still happening in Brussels with some of the, the ministers at the same time that we're talking about some of the top jobs in, in von der Leyen's commission. Absolutely. And the deadline for all of the member states, all of the countries of Europe to submit their names, their candidates, is tomorrow to give those to, to Versailles von der Leyen. Then the sort of horse trading, I should say, begins. I mean, really continues in terms of who gets what portfolio. I mean, some of the names we were familiar with, we know who France is putting up, Thierry Breton, maybe a little controversially. We've got Dombrovsky still around. But remember, all of these people are probably going to get different portfolios. He doesn't want trade. No, he He's does made not want, it really clear no. he doesn't want trade. He does, not, he does not want trade. And I think it's interesting, though, also when you think about the sort of large ambitions that the EU has in terms of what they need to deal with, whether it's um, you know, the security and defense and really that also thorny question of competitiveness, mm-hmm. what you really need if you want to make big reforms and make big moves in the EU are strong countries, strong leading countries. You yeah. do not have that in Germany. You do not have that in France. Generally, you also need a crisis. Right. Europe, Europe generally needs a crisis. We've got plenty to of those, get, though. Do we? They're, yeah. the, they're the slow burn crisis, which is yeah. the worst kind of crisis Precisely. for Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Europe needs a, an acute crisis rather than the chronic crisis. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the other stories you need to be watching this morning. Bloomberg has learned that Brookfield Asset Management is in talks with several investment funds to join its bid to acquire the Spanish blood plasma company Griffoles. Sources say the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund, ADQ, and the Singaporean counterparts, GIC, are amongst the investors the Brookfield has held discussions with over a potential partnership. No agreement has been reached with any of these funds. Intel is said to be exploring options to cope with this historic slump. According to Bloomberg sources, the company is working with investment bankers to help navigate the most difficult period in this business's 56-year history. And Bloomberg has also learned that NVIDIA has discussed joining a funding round for OpenAI that would value the AI startup at more than $100 billion. Apple and Microsoft are also also in the talks to invest this according to sources if the discussions move forward it would mean the three most valuable tech companies are all backing open ai there is quite the game afoot here i'm trying to work out what the strategy is you have to be in because you don't want others to to take control we were talking about this yesterday the day before is this a potential takeout by one of these companies they've all got a vested interest if they don't invest the other company gets the upper hand I, it, there's something it, of geopolitics in this. It does, <laughs> it, there's definitely a kind of strategy going on here and it's and it's i don't think it's about the ai i think it's about control well it absolutely is, especially because Microsoft has a 49% stake in OpenAI. So that's what you're competing with. The valuation, I think, is fascinating. $100 billion. How much of that is hooked or uh, based on the rally that we've seen in NVIDIA and the AI demand that's driving that? How much of that is flowing into the deal flow? Because if you get some sort of correction in the chip sector, in the tech sector, yep. driven by questions around AI demand, which has been the conversation out of NVIDIA, at least, or at least slowing demand from the enterprise side, when does that show up in a valuation of well, $100 that's what Richard, billion? Dollars? This is what Richard Windsor was talking about. He was talking about the fact that there's too much money floating around in this space. These valuations are being driven up too much. You get any cracks appearing, the valuations come down super quickly. And at that point, some of these AI startup companies become real takeout targets. Yeah, and I wonder if I can try to tie all of these stories in together in one tight, tidy bow. I mean, Intel was another company that was meant potentially to join and to try to yep. get a piece out of OpenAI. They said no to that. Now you look at the trouble that they're having. We have reporting out that they may have to can some of their factories, one of those factories is going to be in Germany with, with 10 billion euros worth of subsidies. Could that move? They've been very silent on that.
It's it's a fascinating one. I love that you tied it all into <laughs> into a bow. That's a tricky one to do, but you, you've led me nicely into what's coming up on the show. Germany's political fringe taking center stage ahead of regional elections on Sunday, as we just discussed. We're going to speak to the Bundestag member Otto Fricke next. Plus, chips under pressure. Intel looking for solutions as ASML has new curbs on its China dealings. Those imposed, of course, by the Dutch government. But up next, we go back to the data. Investors awaiting the Fed's preferred inflation gauge in the States as Europe. ICPI figures from France as well as the Eurozone. If you have any questions for us or for our guests, get involved in the conversation. IB plus BBTV Go is the function. This is Bloomberg. When you look at peripheral, do you put France into the peripheral or outside the peripheral? That's now the big question, in fact. What is sure is that France has to, to, to reform that Greek Portugal uh, have done. People that bet against Italy uh, during the past 10 years, they lose money. You lose every time money when you bet against Italy. Every year when you buy uh, Italian bonds versus German bonds, what could go wrong? Yes, it could you know, increase by uh, uh, 20 or 30 basis points, but at the end, do you really think that uh, Italy will go into the limbus? Rianne Hallier, fixed income fund manager at Carmignac, speaking to us yesterday, talking about France's precarious public finances, comparing France to what we're seeing maybe on the periphery, and why you shouldn't bet against BTPs. That's been something of a tough trade. It's really interesting. During the month of August, we've seen the British pound outperforming. We've certainly seen the euro outperforming as well uh, against the dollar. It's up by 2.32%. Month to date, you've also seen bond markets generally across Europe doing reasonably well, particularly at the front end. The expectation is that rates are coming down. The UK, the one exception. The bond market is kind of positioning itself for a story of rate cuts and maybe recessions. The equity market continues to tell a very different story. Paul Skinner, Investment Director for Fixed Income at Wellington Management, joins us now. Paul, great to see you. Great to see you, Guy. So... Um, You've seen a lot of political volatility during this month in Europe. You've got a story of recessions developing around the world, of rate cuts coming through. The expectations are growing. Yeah. The, equity markets, the equity market sees a soft landing. Everything's great. Right. Which one do you think is right? Well, I think the, the whole thing is we are now going to enter some serious volatility. Risk assets, as you say, are fully priced. They are fully priced for what we see ahead. You've got two of the biggest central banks, the ECB and the Fed, both nailed on to cut rates in September. Whereas you've got the biggest savings nation in the world, Japan, raising rates. Now that is going to create capital market movements. And as we go post the Labour uh, yep. weekend into the new term, we see volatility coming. So that little taster we had in... That was a August, taster, was it? That was a taster. And because you saw the carry trades close... Yeah, obviously yeah. out of here. But there is a bigger carry trade behind that, which is that immense savings from Japan that have flowed out as they had zero interest rates into foreign investments. That is going to start to flow back as we see rates increase in Japan. That's going to create volatility. And, you know, we've got in the background political worries. We've got plenty for the next couple of months to, uh, to create that very volatility. And that's volatility we can take advantage of as yep. active managers at Wellington, because that's what we do. We're active managers. T tell us how. <laughs> how do you trade it? Well, how do we trade it? You've got to be a provider of liquidity. You've got to be selling as people are, you know, in this selling high val valuation. Risk assets, taking a little bit of profit, building up a little liquidity, because when that volatility comes, you want to be the provider, as I say, of liquidity, buying some of those assets that people are worried about. And so, so we don't see a disaster coming up. We don't see a big recession out of the US. We see probably you're going to clip a coupon over the next year. But intra, you know, quarter, intra month, you're going to see some exciting opportunities to make money. But you, you make a key point, which is that this immense savings, the carry trade that you mentioned, is going to create kind of a, a redispersion of capital flow. Absolutely. 
it sounds like you're saying those capital flows may go to the states, which is why you take profit now to provide that liquidity, if I'm understanding it correctly. But does the election and then does the budget ceiling talk in January affect that? Do people want to be underweight the U.S. for the Absolutely. next six months? Well, the big question is if the Fed talk too dovishly, you're going to see an outflow out of the U.S. dollar. Yeah? We're going to see a continued advance in the yen. We're going to see appreciation of emerging market currencies. That could create a serious flow out of the U.S. So in the background, you've got the political situation. You've got the fact that now, you know, Harris is looking better in the polls. It's a true two-horse race. Yeah. And that old story of Trump trades, yeah. you know, the inflationary story from Trump being protectionist and his fiscal stimulus... Well, let me let me ask you this: On the two horses, who is more inflationary between the two of them? We regard Trump as the inflationary one. That's the one that we want to put steepeners on. That's where we want to, you know, be ready for the fact that protectionism is intrinsically inflationary. The fact that you know, if you're going to really throw the fiscal uh, doors wide open, what about the open, subsidies and, and that sort of thing from the Kamala Harris side of things? Do you think that that is also a risk to inflation? We will be more sort of status quo okay. on the inflationary story. And I've got to admit, Wellington, we're slightly inflationists. You know, we believe there are some big secular drivers of inflation that haven't been conquered. Demographics, not enough workers in developed markets, and the fact that, uh, you know, geopolitical things are making supply lines. And on the question of inflation in Europe, because obviously we're going to get the data out today, yep. probably going to solidify what we expect from the ECB in September. I think longer term, there's a question of what we expect from the ECB. As you were saying that it's better to travel than to arrive at the ECB. Where are we going to arrive at the ECB? Because they have not dealt with 2% inflation on a sustained period for a very, very long time. That's exactly right. So, uh, you know, I think the September cut nailed on by the market. It's going to happen. But then the questions will arise. Where do they go from there? You've got two-speed Europe at the moment. You've got a, a Germany that hasn't grown in real terms since COVID, whereas the rest of uh, Europe has grown 6% in real terms. That's a big, uh, you know, divide. And, you know, Germany has incipient inflation that you're just going to feed with more rate cuts. So is the remedy to a supply shock rate cuts? That's what the market's going to question. OK, let's talk about inflation in a little bit more mm -hmm. detail. If the Fed cuts 50, which some people are talking about, mm. between now and Christmas, is that inflation, does inflation come back? Is there a danger? Bostick's been talking about this, Nagel's been talking about this in Europe. They're not 100% convinced, to your point, mm -hmm. that the inflation genie is back in. If the Fed starts and the ECB starts a significant rate-cutting cycle, yeah. is there a danger that they get halfway through it? and realise that inflation is picking back up again. Absolutely. That's, that's the worst-case scenario for markets. It is complete disaster for markets. So, you know, they have to go very cautiously, and that's what they're all saying. So how far it. do they go and how quickly do they go? It's a 25 in September, Yep. and then a wait and see. Now, do we think they're going to get 100 in by the end of the year? Absolutely not. You know, that is over-optimistic by the market that there'll be a 100 uh, basis point cut by the end of the year because you've got this incipient inflation in the background. So... Absolutely. We don't have a, a U.S. economy that's falling off a cliff. It doesn't need aggressive rate yeah. cuts. So you're right. The worry would be that inflation comes back. So I think it'll be a wait and see after that 25 in September as to how much they do. And that may well disappoint the market for a while. Equity market. Bond risk market. Asset, ri yeah. risk assets, bond markets. You know, yeah. that's the volatility that I'm talking about. OK. We all done? Anybody else got any more questions? I think we've nailed the inflation story with Paul. Thank you very much indeed. Paul Skinner, Investment Director for Fixed Income at Wellington Management. Coming up, we're going to go back to the political story as well. Just been talking about it. Germany's political fringe taking centre the centre stage. This ahead of regional elections Sunday. We're going to be joined by an FDP lawmaker. Otto Fricker is going to be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. minutes to the start uh, of trading here in Europe to the opening trade, last trading day of the month. Um, it's been an interesting week thus far. I suspect it's going to be quieter today as we head towards uh, the Labor Day holiday over in the United States. Let's talk about the politics, though, that are likely to increasingly move markets over the next few months. Germany absolutely front and center this weekend. Two states in Germany's former communist east will elect new regional governments Sunday. Over half of voters are set to back anti-establishment parties in a signal that the political centre 
maybe it's starting to crumble. Oli. Yeah, Guy, let's run through what we're expecting. We'll get to the bulls, polls in just a second, but let's set up the parties that are really going to be the game changers here. So the AFD, the alternative for Deutschland, is the far-right party within Germany. We've talked about it for many, many years, but this is really the year where they're starting to take a sort of advantage, particularly in these two regions in the east of Germany. As you can see, they're sort of maintaining their leads there. I mean, in Saxony, it's a little bit closer. The CDU may be able to eke out a sort of win there. But, you know, this is all about sort of um, uh, immigration and also support for Ukraine. These are, these are, this is a party that really is not in support of that. And some of these sort of groups, some of the sort of minor parties in certain regions have been designated extremists. So really, this is going to be a big question. None of the party, of, uh, none of the mainstream parties want to work with them. But there's a fly in the ointment for them. You now have Sarah Wagenknecht, who's, who launched her far left party in Germany only this year, that is cannibalizing some of that support in some of these eastern regions. I mean, they sort of are united on two issues, on the issue of immigration, both anti and both on Ukraine, which is a sort of pulling back support for Ukraine. So these are the two sort of parties that are sort of really protagonists going into the elections. And if we look at what we see in terms of the polling here, well, taking one just one of the regions in Saxony here, if we have that graphic by any chance, uh, but we're basically expecting the CDU potentially to come in in the first, but really it's going to be the AFD that's going to do a very well there. And what I think is interesting is it's also a referendum on what we're expecting from the governing parties, right? You have the SPD, Schultz's party coming in at 6%, the Greens at 3 and the FDP isn't even on here because when you get less than 5% in some of these uh, parties, you basically get knocked out out of the parliament. So we have a lot to talk about with our next guest, Otto Frecke, who is a member of the Bundestag. He sits on the budget policy, uh, the budget committee um, for Germany, which is currently in deliberations. We have so much to talk about. Otto, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Really great to talk to you. I'd like to get a, an idea from you. If the AFD wins in these regions, if they do very well and these extremes do well, what does it tell us about German politics right now? Well, it tells us a little bit of a problem that we have all over Europe, that people are not agreeing anymore with, well, on the one hand side, the Social Democrats, on the other side, more the Conservatives. The uh, question of where is this continent going to, where is Germany going to, is the question that is raised. And especially in East Germany, where people went through a lot of changes. Keep in mind, they had a national law socialist system there, then uh, a socialist communist system there, then they had reunification, then the strengthening of Europe, and now they find out that Germany isn't the Germany it has been in the 80s or 90s, and that makes people, well, thinking about changing and thinking about voting for different uh, parties, and that is one of the reasons why, especially in the east of Germany. And Otto, what I think is very interesting is that you have the sort of, among the establishment parties, you have the CDU and the SPD. They aren't really offering a huge amount that is terribly new. What you do have in terms of the mainstream parties offering new things, I think, is the FDP, your party, and the Greens. Why do you think that is not cutting through right now in a moment when, in Germany, they do want change and it's going more to the extremes? Well, it's like, like, like as it is in life, it is in private life. Uh, if you want to change things, your emotional idea is change it fast. There is an easy way of changing things. And I always do say, compare politics, compare society with a relationship. There are no easy answers. But if somebody tells you, oh, there is an easy answer, probably you're going to say that's the easiest way out to, to get rid of my fears. And that is what we do see in East Germany way more than in the West, but also in the West. Keep in mind, uh, the AFD in the West is above 10 percent. The problem for my party, the Greens, the Social Democrats being in this government is that the changes that are necessary economically, environmentally, society-wise, are those who work very slowly and are very differentiated. And in times where you see economic growth is not there, you have problems. Last argument, and that is maybe one of the reasons why, for example, my party has some difficulties, as you mentioned, is that even though economy numbers are, let's say, we're always, what I say, we grow or degrow around recession, uh, is that people say, but the in unemployment is okay. And as long as unemployment is okay, that's fine. And the last argument, of course, migration, which gives a lot of people a lot of fear. Otto, good morning. It's Guy. When do you think your party will be prepared to work with the AFD? Oh, I don't see that right now. See, here we go to German specialty. Um, the AFD definitely is a right-wing party. How far right? How far are we national socialist comparable party? How far are we a fascist party that we do have with the AFD? Uh, that is a question. I can't see that. I can see that, that I would go, uh, that my party would do a coalition with a party that, that has an idea of if somebody's skin color is different than the own, then probably you should expel them. I don't have a chance, I don't see a chance to go with a party 
that thinks that women, uh, women's yep. jobs to a certain degree shouldn't be, shouldn't be uh, the normal jobs, but more back at home. So I don't see that. OK, so you don't see it now. Do you see how, how do therefore you see coalitions working in the future in Germany? Because the current coalition is clearly struggling and we are seeing its message not resonating in these votes that we're going to see this weekend. Now, maybe there are idiosyncratic regional factors that are part of that. But at some point, the debate is going to have to happen as to how the centre is going to figure out how to work with the fringes, because otherwise coalitions might not work in the future. Yeah, I, I, I do absolutely agree with what you just said. The, the real problem is that we had that in our history. If you look back at the Weimar times, so uh, just switch back like some, some 90, 90 years or 100 years uh, here in Berlin, this was the same development. The center was really shrinking a lot. And then how do you find a solution? And then if you shrink and you have to find compromises, you do compromises. None of those parties that do the compromises like at all. In, I think we will see that with the elections in the next uh, two, three months. Do we have a coalition there? Is the, are the Christian Democrats going to go into a coalition probably? Or do we have minority governments? Will that work? Germany has the, the big problem that we haven't had that. We were very stable. We always had two or three party coalitions, but this, this is over. And if you look all over Europe, you find, let's take, let's take the Netherlands, you at the end have four, four party coalitions. Or you might have two or one party that is tolerated, and then the government is looking for majorities in parliament. So it's going to be a time of change. One little advantage we do have, that is the 5% threshold, even though that is not good in favor for my party right now in these state elections. But it stabilizes because it's not like, oh, everybody is, is, is founding its own party so, so he can have the maybe number 1,000 idea that solves all the problems. Otto, it's Creedy in London. Let's go from the politics and dive more into the economics if we can here. And I really want to talk about the budget. Of course, we know this has been an issue across Europe, specifically, famously, in, in Germany as well. Walk us through the sticking points here. What is the game changer for some of these discussions that are happening around the budget when it comes to security, military spend, aid to Ukraine, even unemployment benefits uh, within Germany? For you, what's top of mind? Uh, let's be honest. Germany has an economical problem. We, we, we are not totally shrinking, but uh, all the great times where we really had a profit because of China growing that fast and we could export almost everything made in Germany uh, to that country or to the reason this is over. B, the industrial fundament that Germany had has to be modernized and therefore you need investment. These investments are not coming because there is no trust and no security. Workforce is getting older. My generation, I'm born 65, is uh, slowly going into retirement, which, which leads to problems. Germany only does have a chance at least, but here we go into party politics and that's the opinion of my party. If we trigger people to invest in Germany, either let's say from companies or even private investment, people are too insecure to invest and, and because of that it's a problem. And that leads to a budget where we have the so-called debt break. I know where everybody said, oh, them Germans always this uh, debt break so they can spend. We can spend. We can even do 0, 0.3.5. Uh, um, GDP, uh, we can do debt. But um, the problem is we haven't invested in the last years. We haven't invested in our famous autobahns, so it's getting slower. We can't even drive as fast as we want. We have problems, of course, because we thought, oh, defense, no problem, freedom, peace all the time. So where does the money come from? And here, and that is what is right now happening, what will happen within the next two years, where do we agree, as we did two years ago when Ukraine was attacked, to have extra budgets? But therefore, you need a two-thirds majority. This is something I don't see with the federal elections coming up in less than a year. Well, Otto, as a, as a fellow Texan who likes to drive on, uh, on, on speedily on highways, I fully understand your plight. But I, I, I want to kind of dive into the part that you made about the lack of investment there. This isn't something uh, Europe is, is really able to attract broadly. How do you incentivize domestic investment, given the looming threat that you just outlined from China as well? How do you incentivize that piece in the in within Germany. Well, let's be honest. Uh, when 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 we talk about this, uh, we know there's a lot of psychology behind this. So you can always do um, some tax refunds, some tax credits. You can do special uh, um, regulations. You can try to copy the IRA as in the United States, but I think that is not going to work. What we really have to do is we have to change our mentality. 
Therefore, we Germans, politicians as well as people, need to accept that, that old story where Germany is, is going to get through all the problems is not running anymore. We're not in that situation right now. You can see that with the elections because, as we talked about, these parties like AFD or B BSW, yeah. they want to go back into the good old times. And as long as that is not working, we can probably argue as much as we want. And Last I, point, and that is very and important, I, is what is the future of Germany in Europe? And this is a leadership position which we don't take and, yet. And, and that is exactly where I want to go, Otto, because the German leadership is a question that I want to have. And so we saw in the last couple of weeks where we saw the finance ministry, your party, saying that basically there will be no new money to Ukraine. I know that there's already committed money. I know all of that. But I want to ask you about the signal that that sends. Why is this sort of the, the accountants of Germany on domestic issues setting out and sending the signals on geopolitics to Russia, to the United States? Doesn't Germany need to kind of get this together so it can take a more prominent leadership role, not just in Europe, but on the global stage? Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to get that question to, to put some things into order. Number one, uh, just one year ago, it was like, oh, Germany is not giving enough for Ukraine. Then finally, and, and Great Britain is doing more, France is doing more, blah, 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 blah. Found out, oh, it's the typical German way. The others announced we're delivering. Because if you look, look at the absolute numbers in the last years, and this is going to stay, it's the next point, we are the ones who deliver second most after the United States. Three, yes, in the budget for 25, in the budget draft that was given by the government, we reduce, we half it. But this has a lot to do with the fact that G7 agreed that the frozen assets that Russia does have and what we get out of the frozen assets, in addition, are going to be used for Ukraine. So that if you look, what is coming to Ukraine will not go down. Third. Uh, I'm a member of parliament since 2002. I know a lot of the members of, of the German government. So let me, let me really state that clear here. I don't know anybody who wants to do less for Ukraine. It's just the way we want to do it is probably going to be different. But at the end, and I think in one year we're again going to see, oh, Germans as always, little complicated, little argumentation, little technical, but at the end they're going to deliver. Ukraine is our front line defending Germany as well. And keep in mind how many Ukrainian people are living here in Germany right now as fugitives. So yeah, no, and I believe that there that will be is, at the end enough yeah. tanks and rockets and everything. Yeah, I figured, and that figure is more over a million people. So Otto Fricke, thank you so much. Member of the Bundestag, member of the FDP, thank you for uh, speaking and actually making the voice of Germany heard this morning on Bloomberg Television. Coming up next, we're going to look at the stocks to watch, including ThyssenKrupp Steel, a CEO set to leave following a dispute over the division's future. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. Eight forty six in Paris, the inflation data drops. It is slightly higher than anticipated, in contrast to maybe what we saw out of Germany yesterday. Uh, the harmonized number comes through at two point two on an annualized basis. Now that is down from two point seven, but it's still above the two point one that maybe economists were looking for. Consumer spending looks a little bit soft, GDP looks a little bit soft as well. But you do see a little tick higher. I want to see whether that continues in the euro this morning after some weakening yesterday. Joining us now, Paul Dobson, Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets. Paul, can we assume that a rate cut out of the ECB, given the totality of the inflation data, is nailed on? I don't think so. I don't think nailed on yet, Guy. Uh, I think that although we're seeing uh, the headline numbers coming down, the core is that little bit more sticky, and that's creating a little bit of a... Um, you know, sort of disconnect on the governing council between those that would like to see more evidence that inflation is firmly under control and, and the doves that say, saying, you know, as, as you just said, that it's a bit of a no-brainer, uh, no questions to be asked. This is an obvious choice for us to make. And I think that's why you're seeing that support coming into the euro. Now, if you look at the long-term prognosis, yes, inflation is definitely uh, on its downward path. If you look at five-year, five-year inflation swaps, they've definitely come down some way, just a little bit above uh, that 2% level now. 
uh, on the longer term basis. But at the same time, you know, you don't want to cut too hard and then be forced into uh, retracement to go the other way again. That's what the Fed's very worried about as well. And so that's why there's some caution in the governing council. And, and that idea that maybe even if there is another cut coming, that the ECB may be going a little bit more hesitantly and slowly than the Fed looks like it's going to be uh, doing once it starts on in uh, September. Paul, from an FX point of view, what matters more? Some of the European inflation numbers that were, of course, hitting the wires, Guy just mentioned, the PCE or the PCE data later today? I think that uh, overall, everybody is still watching all of those numbers coming out of the U.S. Critty. And PCE is going to be pretty important. But next week's payrolls, of course, is going to be absolutely critical for this, for determining how hard the Fed comes out of the blocks. Is it going to go 50 or 25 in September? It looked like 25 was pretty obvious. Uh, but, but a little bit more of that pricing has come back in on the 50. Uh, we've seen, you know, some more strength in the data this week, but it's a little bit kind of up and down at the moment. I think that, you know, overall for FX, everybody's going to be fascinated still uh, on that Fed path and on what the outlook for U.S. inflation looks like as well. For the euro specifically, uh, it feels like, you know, it, it's moving in line with a lot of the rest of the currency markets at the moment. It's uh, following the sort of trajectory against the dollar and the dollar really is holding the key to everything. And the dollar has been on a strongly downward path for quite a while now. And you've seen currencies around the world coming up against it as a result. Well, Paul, if, if the dollar is holding the key, the Chinese government also holding another key this morning, saying that they might allow refinancing on $5.4 trillion worth of mortgages. Paul, can you take us through how significant that is? It is certainly creating a bid over in the Chinese equities. Is this the stimulus everyone's been waiting for or not quite? It, 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 is, it is a sign that the policymakers are paying more attention to the needs of the uh, market, which is that they need to free up some consumer spending power. Um, the, the changes in the mortgages wouldn't count for new uh, first-time home buyers. They're already benefiting from it. It's people that are on existing mortgages who would have the opportunity to finance at the start of next year, but can now bring that forwards. And particularly if you have the banks competing against each other for that business, that should drive down rates, make their monthly spending less and give them more cash to put it back into the economy. And that's what uh, is giving everybody that boost is that kind of feel good factor and the hope that more measures will follow through afterwards. Certainly something we're going to be keeping our eye on. Paul Dobson, Bloomberg's executive editor for Asia Markets, we thank you so much. On to another story in the tech space we've got our eye on. Intel, Intel excuse me, said to be exploring options to cope with its historic slump. According to Bloomberg sources, the company working with investment bankers to help navigate its most difficult period in its 56-year history. Let's bring in Robert Lee from Bloomberg Intelligence. Oh, Rob, Robert, walk us through the Intel story here. Why are they making such a drastic move? OK, how long do we have to explain? But I'll keep it brief. Four main <laughs> things. One is this company's faced strategic challenges for a number of years because its growth is tied to the PC sector. PC sector is a very um, mature industry. They're also coming under uh, increasing competition within servers, which sort of underpins their profitability and cash flow. So that's the first point. Secondly, they've tried to diversify into new in, uh, sectors. Probably 15 years or so ago, they tried to go into wireless, didn't have great success there. More foundry more recently, but obviously that's a sector dominated by Intel. The company has a fairly full cost base, I would say, compared to most of its peers. Just to throw a couple of figures at you, their entire um, uh, headcount uh, exceeds the combined headcount of TSMC and NVIDIA. So it's about 125,000 employees. Um, so, you know, a significant amount of cost being uh, carried there and where there's no prospect to sort of reignite their growth Clearly, they're looking at ways to improve the bottom line and try and reduce the costs, which if you cast your mind back earlier this month, they announced plans to lay off about 15% of their employees. So this news that we've seen today is unconfirmed, but a potential spin out of their loss making foundry business could be a way to cut costs and maybe they can then refocus their um, resources on trying to reignite growth within their core business. And Robert, what a week it's been for the chip makers, really hitting every note of the sort of symphony around the sort of news flow around here. We've got the ASML news, Biden uh, administration putting pressure on. What do we get there? Is this just because Biden has basically ramped up the pressure on the Dutch? Uh, again, completely unconfirmed. But yes, that's the obvious conclusion, isn't it? It ties into the geopolitical uh, tensions and pressures and, you know, going back to chip wars. So the unconfirmed report we've seen, to, yeah, the unconfirmed report we've seen today 
is that maybe the Dutch government will not renew licenses uh, on the maintenance side on some of this advanced chip making equipment. Obviously, that, if that is true, would be a major stumbling block uh, in China's efforts to achieve uh, self-sufficiency on the semiconductor side. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert Lee, Bloomberg Intelligence, for joining us this morning, helping us through some of these chip stories. Let's get to Joe Easton right now with the equities team for what's moving today. So we're keeping an eye on Griffles over in Spain today. This after Brookfield Asset Management is said to be speaking to some sovereign wealth funds, including in Asia and the Middle East, about a takeover worth around 5 billion euros for the company. This is according to a Bloomberg exclusive. And look at what it did to the US listed stock last night, around a 5% gain, though it did start coming down later in the session. Bear in mind that this is heavily lower over the past year, given that short report we saw from Gotham Research at the start of this year. Then we're also looking at fees and crude. This is after a shock exit of the company's steel CEO amid a tussle around a restructure and a potential sale of the German unit to the Czech billionaire Daniel Krasinski. Now, this company is also one that's seen a heavy share price drop amid weakening demand for their steel output, down 65% over the past three years. Finally, keep an eye on sportswear stocks, Adidas, Puma and also JD Sports. Lululemon slumped initially after downgrading its guidance but actually rallied later in the session. Analysts think they might have kitchen synced the earnings update. Sportswear stocks could get a little lift this morning. Equities are about to open. We'll find out which stocks move. That's coming next. This is Bloomberg. minutes to go until we kick off the Friday trading session. Uh, we are posting video. We are pre the U.S. holiday. It's Labor Day. The U.S. is out on Monday. That's probably going to affect trading patterns a little bit later on today. What we did see yesterday was a bit of a sell-off in the United States uh, towards the end of the session. Europe has got to price that in. I think London's probably looking a little bit more positive. Elsewhere, maybe a little bit of negativity creeping in. Ollie, what are you seeing? That's right, Guy. Uh, we got a little bit of negativity on the Eurostoxx 50, down by about one-eighth of one percent uh, this morning for the last day of trade of the week and of the month of August. FTSE 100 futures up about half of a percentage point there. And then NASDAQ futures taking some of that back today, half of one percent up uh, this morning as we head into the European Open. Yeah, Ollie, when you kind of zoom in, though, I feel like there's a lot of M&A news that's coming out today. Uh, Joe was talking about the big story coming out of Spain slash Canada, which is a weird combo traditionally. But Brookfield basically courting sovereign funds to join the Grifols takeover bid. This is a really big deal. This is 10 billion euros approximately on the table. Uh, there's been estimates about 8 billion euros. Basically, they're trying to get a lot of private investors, including sovereign funds out of the Middle East, on board to take this company private. This is a very big deal. Of course, it's been family owned for ages. Dealing with a short report, we're going to dive into the details in the next hour, see how the stock shakes out. Nokia is another one we've got our eye on. Remember in yesterday's trade, you did see reports that Samsung may be considering some sort of investment, potentially even a takeover bid. We are going to see how that shakes out in today's trade. Remember, Nokia still assessing the deal flow, no real comments, but could have an effect in today's initial trade. And lastly, uh, ThyssenKrupp losing their CEO. We'll see how that shakes out. Maybe not really welcome news given such a surprise for the company. Guy. So some potential action at the single stock level, index level maybe less so. Let's take a look. It is time for the Friday opening trade. Here we go. This is what we're looking at. We are post NVIDIA. We are waiting for the U.S. holiday. We're waiting for payrolls also next week out of the United States. We've got a bit of inflation data we need to digest today, but it does seem as if we are starting off, as we seem to have done for the bulk of this week, on a fairly quiet footing. London expected to gain a little bit of traction, maybe advancing a little bit more than maybe some of its peer group. You are seeing interesting things happening in the commodity market right now. So London is up by three-tenths of one percent. The stock 600, absolutely flat. The Spanish market's up by two-tenths of one percent. The DAX is down a little bit. No clear signal, I don't think, at an index level as to what is really happening in the equity market this morning. So let's dive a little deeper. Ollie, what's going on? Yeah, Guy, we're getting a couple of signals here from the sort of group level here where we see technology being sold off this morning, down by one percentage point. We should say, however, Guy, yesterday on NVIDIA Day when we were talking about technology, the Stocks Europe 600 technology closed up 2% yesterday. So we're taking some of that off the table today, um, down by about 1%. The biggest gainers this morning are going to be in basic resources, utilities and banks, all about one half of one percentage point uh, to the upside. Again, technology now is 
accelerating losses a little bit down by one percentage point. But again, they rose 2% yesterday. So just taking some of that off the table. Well, we'll dive more into the details there. You talked about the tech underperformance. It's your big heavyweights. It's actually your outperformers yesterday that we all kind of scratched our heads about. ASML, SAP are, are, are the big ones, your biggest weights on the index. You're seeing ASM as well, Infineon as well, all dropping. So tech really taking a little bit of a beating today, to your point. But to the upside, it's the rotation again. You're seeing the oil stocks guy that we talked about underperforming yesterday outperforming today uh, and moving the index to the upside. But for me, it's still those single level stocks I want to keep an eye on. Grifols is, of course, top of mind for me. Higher by about 1.8% uh, driving the entire Spanish index higher as well. Uh, but then you've got a couple of other names. One of your favorites as an underperformer, Schneider Electric. Uh, it's got numbers next week, I think. We've got numbers next week. I think we've got numbers out from Schneider next week. Maybe a bit of positioning around that. It's also an AI trade. So yeah. it does get caught up in that technology story. So while it is a kind of electrification um, switching kind of a, a kind of a company, it, it is very much part of the um, that trade. So I think you can kind of basket it up maybe with what we're seeing to Ollie's point about what was going on in the technology space. ASML is down. SAP is down. Schneider's down. Those are the three top points losers yeah. on the stock 600 this morning. Feels like a little bit of an unwind, maybe yeah. of that position that we saw, um, maybe coming through to Ollie's point a little bit yesterday. Banks are up. Commodities are up. Uh, we should also mention that ThyssenKrupp is down 1.2 percent. That stock, uh, we're not really welcoming the news that their CEO is, is, is taking a step down. We're no. talking about those, those individual moves. So that's going to be one that we've got our eye on. It's in, I, I think there's some similarities between the, the Nokia story this morning and the Intel story. Ooh. Both, Ooh. Companies, both companies kind of has, have this kind of history behind them. They've got this, this name recognition I, you guys didn't, but I did growing up with Nokia phones. A huge company that then fell by the wayside on the mobile phone handset side, but then switched the, to, the, to the gear side and is now struggling and is looking at breakups to try and figure out how to right-size itself and get itself back on track. Intel's doing exactly the same thing right now and thinking about how it's going to maybe walk away from that foundry business and maybe not make the moves that it's talked about. And both companies in sectors that are really supposed to be getting a lot of upside lifts yeah. that are really not, whether it's Intel with the chips and the semiconductor story and Nokia, you think about it, I mean, Huawei is being banned from a lot of, company, or from a lot of countries it within Europe. It should be. It should be. That yeah. and Ericsson should be catching a huge bid, but they just don't have the pricing that these Chinese companies have. Ericsson, I think, has had a better time of things. Nokia has definitely struggled more and has been and has lost yeah. that to Ericsson on some really key mm. contracts. Um, so it's I, I find that I find it's interesting that these are two similarities, two names that did really well in the past, two CEOs that are really struggling to get this business. Gelson just really struggled to get Intel back on track. And apparently there's some key meetings coming up talking about breaking the company up, talking about figuring out a new strategy going forward. Does he survive that? Certainly the bankers are in trying to figure out what they're going to do next. It's really interesting one. I thought the, the Ericsson story that you point out is, is crucial because the CEO has been very, obviously, uh, anti-regulation, but been very vocal about it in, in a way that I haven't seen other European uh, CEOs take on that, uh, that topic. So that's one topic. That's the micro. Um, I don't yep. have a great pivot to this, but the macro also matters here. We're getting comments uh, or lines, I should say, from uh, ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel speaking on inflation monetary policy at an event in Estonia, basically saying a lot of what we already know here, that inflation momentum continues to be high, disinflation and services has stalled since November. If you look at this at the actual yeah. chart here, you do see a horizontal line looking at those live pictures again coming out of Estonia. She is saying that the current level of inflation understates the challenges that the ECB yeah. is facing. I thought that was some pretty interesting commentary and that the pace of policy should proceed gradually and cautiously. Conditions are in place, however, for inflation to hit 2% by the end of 2025. That's a really far that's really far away. She's only cautious, isn't she? Like she is at the hawkish end of the spectrum. Yeah, and I yeah. wonder how much coordination there is, because this echoes a lot it's of Noggle. what we've been hearing from Nagel last night. Yeah, yeah, basically saying that, you know, September, no one's too fussed about that. They seem to want to be pricing that in. But it's really the longer path for uh, ECB rates, wanting to leave flexibility and really setting up a debate there um, at the ECB for what you do longer term with rates. It's not mechanical, which I think is interesting, because the market's kind of... is pricing this kind of relatively smooth story in terms of how quickly the rate cuts come. You, you maybe do start off a little bit faster, but actually in the ECB's case, maybe not. And then you kind of go sort of relatively steadily. She's saying that is not necessarily the case. Maybe pushing back maybe against how the market has set this one up. Can I just say it's interesting that she's making, and I think this is just a coincidence in timing here, that she's uh, making these comments right off the back of that French inflation data, which did come below the 2% target. Harmonized, it didn't, but uh, we, we, that's just 24 hours after we saw the same thing in Germany as well. I thought that was really... Um, uh, fascinating. She, her point is that it's in services. Right. 
So the headline number is is coming down, but she's worried about that core the stickiness, stickiness within yeah. services. Which is something, by the way, you see in the U.S. as well. If you look at the data, yeah. it is that's where you're starting to see uh, the stagnation. So, okay, so that's the macro story. We'll see how that actually shows up. You're not seeing much market reaction off these comments here. Your dollar still at 110. Briefly reacting to that French data that we got earlier, uh, but that's going to be something we keep our eye on. Let's talk about where we go from here, what uh, the next market moves may actually uh, be. Let's bring in Mark's Live Managing Editor, Mark Cudmore, Executive Editor. I think he got promoted. Mark Cudmore joins the program. Uh, Mark, walk us through the story for FX, especially for Euro dollar here. We're getting some kind of positive inflation numbers, um, but we are still very much, it feels like the dollar seems to be the, the, the tail wagging the dog for better, uh, for lack of a better term. Mark, your take on Euro dollar. Yeah, I, I think that Euro dollar has broken out of the range, and I do think it is primarily a dollar story here, and that's, that's generally the case. I think that, you know, Dollar softness has been a bit of a theme in the last couple of months. It's one of the positive factors out there. And I think that's going to largely uh, be a, a trend going forward. Uh, but maybe trend is a dangerous word because I don't expect it to be straight line. Uh, and I think that one of the issues is we're still pricing in uh, too aggressive on rate cuts in the U.S. And I think at some point over the couple of months, that's going to have uh, a corrections at some point, which will cause temporary dollar jumps. So I think that dollar uh, will probably finish the year weaker than it is right now. Uh, I think the election will also weigh in it. Um, but I don't think it's going to be a straight line affair. And I think the easy part of that dollar decline is behind us. Um, well, listen, Mark, it's, we talk about the dollar and the influence there, but I'm also looking at euro sterling, and you've seen an aggressive move down there, so it's not all the dollar. What are you expecting in sort of the differential between the euro and, the, and sterling going forward? We've really seen a lot of uh, weakness out of cable, uh, but also out of euro sterling. Uh, I'm very bearish euro sterling. Now, I will say that I kind of messed this up because I, I published a bearish feature in Euro Sterling when we were down near the lows of the year. Luckily, we're back around that level right now again, um, but it was just before the bounce. But look, I think the UK story is very positive. This is a story which we've been very negative on for most of the last eight years. And I, and I think now we've got a bit of stability in government. We're seeing growth forecasts constantly be upgraded in the UK, admittedly from a very negative place. But the point is, is that the, 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 the first derivative is in a positive direction in terms of the change. Um, so I think you've got cheap assets in the UK. And I, and I think that also their inflation means that their sticky inflation means that they will keep rates a little bit higher, which might give a little bit of an edge. But it's not a problematic inflation story at the moment because we do have global disinflation. We do have energy prices at the lower end of the range, which is kind of helping. Um, so I think that overall, I think Euro Australian can go a lot higher in the next couple of months. And this goes back to Critty's question about Euro dollar. Yeah, I think Euro dollar is kind of broken out of its range, can go a bit higher, but it's more the dollar story there. So that's why I kind of swiveled that to being dollar bearishness, not because I'm bullish euro, not at all bullish euro. And in fact, I think euro sterling goes lower. Mark, good morning. It's Guy. I'm wondering about the debate that's happening within the markets team here at Bloomberg. I've got a piece by Mark Cudmore. Never mind NVIDIA. Everything is looking bullish for stocks. I've got a, fi I got a piece by JP and Michael Masika. There's a feeling of complacency in, these, in this market. I've got a piece by Simon White talking about stocks will lag bonds, whether there's a recession or not. Talk me through the debate right now. Yeah, so I think there's two different debates there. I think for Simon and I, it's a little bit more of a time span thing. He's talking about if a recession comes, you know, what's going to happen there. And it's a bit of a longer term time span. On the shorter term period, I would most of my global team are with JP and Michael Mashika about kind of saying that they think that I'm complacent um, and they think that you know there's only really downside from here because stocks are expensive. Nvidia failed to surge; it failed to completely smash earnings as it did before. I have to say, I do not see like that before. You know, you talked about the single name stock issues. And Guy, you remember the days of NVIDIA earlier. In the mid-2000s, it's of Nokia. So if you remember what happened to Nokia in the mid-2000s, in 2007, Nokia would just beat earnings and there'd be disappointment and the stock would fall. And then two days later, it surged to a fresh record high again. And, and, and I'm not saying that NVIDIA is going to suddenly be at a fresh record yeah. high to the, uh, today or Monday, but I think it's a similar dynamic here. This is an extremely solid stor story delivering earnings. Sure, it's expensive, not nearly as expensive as Tesla, and Tesla's been there for several years, or Costco. It's pretty equivalent to some other stocks out there, but it's a very, very yeah. good growth story with real money behind it. The macro factors are all bullish. The Fed wants to cut. Okay. Growth is good. Consumer is strong. Energy prices are at their lows. Everything is looking bullish right now from a macro perspective. The, the stock market is saying soft landing. The bond market is saying hard landing. They can't be right, Mark. They can't both be right. 
I, I appreciate there's probably a bit of an overlap, but they can't both be right. Yeah, and it's the bond market that is wrong. It looks very wrong at the moment. Now, at some point it's going to end in a hard landing, but it does not look any time close. Economic growth in the U.S. is strong. And globally, it's strong. You know, global growth forecast just got upgraded again this week. 3.1%. We are at 2.6% at the start of the year. We have all this negativity, and yet every week, global growth is getting better. U.S. growth is fine. Consumer is still spending strong on almost all data fronts. The, the, the bond market is wrong to price so many cuts. So I think those yields will rise. And, of course, that is a, is a short-term problem for stocks. But again, it's a bull market. Going back to reminiscences of a stock operator, as old Turkey used to say, <laughs> it's a bull market. Stop worrying about the short-term fluctuations here. The fact is, yields going higher because the economy is too strong for the cuts that are priced is not a negative for stocks. It causes short-term volatility, but it does not derail the stock market. Now, maybe in six months' time, or maybe in three or four months' time, maybe we're due then to price a hard landing and bond market will be right. But right now, today, and for the coming weeks, the stock market is right and the bond market is wrong. That is a rarity from, to, hear, to hear from you. Uh, Mark, we've got to settle the debate. Do stocks always go up? Uh, right now, yes. It's a bull market. I, I mean, and, and that phrase, for those who didn't, haven't read Reminiscences of the Stock Operator, the whole point is, is that, you know, when it is a bull market, stop get lo getting lost in the short-term fluctuations of trying to get, get a better dip or being tactical. Just realize that overall things are going to be going higher in the weeks ahead. Who knows where we're going to be in 24 hours or like an exact week from now. But the point is, several weeks from now, a couple of months from now, this stock market will be higher, materially yep. higher globally, unless something sudden that I, you know, we can't see changes, unless a true black swan, that none of the obvious catalysts look bearish at the moment. And that is the, the backdrop that we've got for the weeks ahead of us. It's my perfect morning. Mark Cardmore, Critty Gibbs are both on the same page. <laughs> Is that, that is that what happens? They're agreeing. Un no. un unclear. You, you think stocks always go up? Mark in, thinks stocks in the long always go term. Up. Don't worry. Mark and I have had this discussion <laughs> for years. <laughs> um, thanks, Mark. Greatly appreciate it. Bloomberg's M Life managing editor, Mark Cudmore, joining us on stocks always going up until they don't. <laughs> Core six looks like this this morning. Let's take a look at what is happening. Technology stocks uh, under a little bit of pressure across Europe. You can see that's the right-hand side of the screen. ASML, Schneider Electric, both softer this morning. Ferrari, I, Ferrari should always be in the red in my book, but actually recently it's been very much in the green uh, and the stock has been climbing sharply higher. A little bit of softness there. Luxury stocks are catching a bid, though, despite what we're seeing with Ferrari, and Novo is back as well. So those are the core six. That's what we're watching at the centre of Europe. Let's talk about some of the other single names that we're watching so carefully. Joe Easton, back over to you. So we are seeing Griffles moving higher in Madrid this morning, around 2.7%. Remember, the Abu Dhabi and potentially Singaporean sovereign wealth funds teaming up with Brookfield, according to the Bloomberg report. They are in discussions around this potential deal. Remember, that company valued at around 5 billion euros. That is a bit of a boost for that one. Then we'll flip over, look at Nokia. Now, we had those reports about them potentially looking to divest that unit yesterday at the telecoms company. We did get comments overnight. The company says that that unit is still a key part of the business and they haven't got anything to report, but still holding on to most of the gain that we saw yesterday, potentially. No smoke without fire on that one. And we'll check in on Season Crew, a bit of a decline. Surprise exit of the company's steel CEO amid this tussle over a restructuring. But that stock lost more than half its value over the past couple of years, given weakness in demand for that company's steel products. And a quick look at the chips. Now, a few things going on yesterday, of course. We had the comments, the reports around the Dutch potentially looking to restrict more of the sales to China. That weighed on ASML and we're seeing a dip back down again. The US chip stocks were also weak in late trading yesterday, potentially a bit of a hangover still from the NVIDIA report. So BE Semi, ASM following ASML lower this morning. But the biggest dropper we've got today is over in Copenhagen. Now this is Ambu down 12%. That was the worst drop in two years, as I looked at my screen just a moment ago, potentially worse than that one. It is medical tech. Looking at UK home builders, meanwhile, we've got some pricing data nationwide. A drop on the month, but over the past couple of years, prices are actually up pretty significantly in the UK, according to analysts. Bavaria Nordic, meanwhile, rattling through them today. We're going back into healthcare because this company is facing potential competition for its MPOX vaccine from a US company called 
bio emerging over in the US last night, dropping on that one. Finally, one morning call to bring you Daimler truck. This one is like the HSBC. It is upgraded to buy. They reckon that the decline in orders in the trucking sector potentially is going to bottom. They like that stock and we're up 0.8% over in Germany today. Joe Easton from our equity team, thank you so much. We're still getting some of these comments from Isabel Schnabel from the ECB making a few comments this morning as we get European inflation data today saying that basically policy should proceed gradually. Conditions are in place for inflation to hit 2%. But by the end of 2025, right, so that's a little longer than potentially many, uh, some of the other ECB members say, um, there's concern about the stickiness, there's concern about sort of domestic um, uh, inflation within Germany. In terms of euro dollar, where that's moving, it's basically dead flat today. We're struggling to get any sort of a convincing narrative on the euro right now. Um, so coming up next, let's uh, potential shareholders in healthcare, telecoms, as Griffiths reportedly faces a takeover bid, and Nokia considers selling off its mobile networks. We'll have more on the M&A action throughout the morning here uh, in Europe. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to the opening trade. About 20 minutes, 21 minutes, I'm going to say, into the European trading session. We are seeing some marginal gains when you look at uh, the Eurostox 50 and kind of the broader indexes. Some slight underperformance, um, I believe, in the DAX. But again, just really flat on the day. So nothing to write and hope about. But I wonder how much of that changes as we get more uh, inflation data in Europe throughout the, throughout the day. And then, of course, uh, the PCE data ahead of the long weekend over in the States. That is your macro picture. But, of course, a lot of M&A news hitting the wire or potential M&A news from Griefels. Uh, to some potential interest in Nokia, to, of course, uh, the poll deal over at Talgo, the train maker in Spain. There's a lot going on in, in the M&A space. Uh, and, of course, as a result, the equity space. Let's bring in an expert on the subject. Silvia Viviano, head of equity capital markets over at Unicredit, joins the program this morning. Silvia, a pleasure to have you this morning. Look, we just had a great conversation um, yesterday, actually, on the, on the program with uh, one of kind of the debt facilitators over at J.P. Morgan, making the argument that capital markets activity is actually due to open up, due to accelerate in the next six months or so, especially when it comes to Europe. Your thoughts on that timing? Thank you, Gretchen. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I do agree with you. So this is a discussion that has been going on for a while now, right? The, there have been high expectations on the equity capital markets uh, since the end of last year. Then clearly there were several aspects, uh, more from a macro and geopolitical perspective, that had a very strong impact on the pipeline. But the reality is that the rosters of companies that are ready and willing to uh, hit the market and get public is important is material and is also very high quality. The reality is that, you know, everyone, both from the bank side and the issuer side, and also from the private equity side, has been waiting um, for a uh, cooling off of the uncertainty and volatility in the market to be ready to hit the market first with the top quality uh, players that they have in their portfolio and with the companies that, because of the sectors they play in or because of the growth expectation, actually need and are willing and looking forward to get listed. So I do agree with you. Expectations are high, um, are positive, and for sure the pipeline is strong. Well, Sylvia, when we talk about this pipeline, though, and I think you're in the perfect vantage point to discuss this, I have a great little fun fact here that when you talk about IPOs in Europe, actually, when it comes to secondary listings in, as well, it's been a 19 percent jump year over year. This is a really big deal when we're talking about really high valuations. How long does that last and how much of that action is coming from this kind of block trade bonanza that we're seeing? I think the block trade bonanza will keep on being the key player in 2024. The reality is that because of the U.S. election, because of the specific calendar implication, there's not going to be um, a, a wide uh, IPO listing window available for the issuers. So I do expect 2024 to end up with still many uh, secondary trades, especially because, you know, the market performance, the fact that the stocks are at all time high, are very conducive for the sell down from private equity or even primary raise for companies to grow, uh, while uh, IPOs are probably getting more towards the 2025 window. 
And in terms of the buildup for those IPOs, in what markets geographically do you see the most buildup? What do you think is going to be the hottest market in terms of listings in Europe in the coming year? Unfortunately, Italy, uh, there are some good players in Italy, but I don't think it's going to be the top um, country in Europe. Probably Germany is uh, definitely at the top of the list. There are a lot of even, let's call them the, uh, you know, the big growth companies that actually need to get listed, but also big companies in PE portfolio that uh, see the IPO as their main or only basically uh, way out uh, and the best way to actually uh, move forward from a company perspective. Uh, so I do expect Germany. Germany to be very active. I do expect France to be quite active. And, and you know, clearly there is the big question mark on the UK. Um, the push and everything and all the changes are quite, um, you know, are definitely getting towards a, a positive and more open markets. Uh, but let's see what's going to happen in the UK. Sylvia, good morning. It's Guy. Um, the short vol trade seems to be back on. Are you surprised about that? I don't know. Listen, it's um, it's coming uh, back and forth. So um, I think the markets was uh, was expecting that. And uh, no, the reality is that I'm I'm I'm, I'm not surprised. It's uh, it's, um, it's 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 as, as we can see from the graph, it's a very volatile market, and so we need to take the best out of it. In terms of, do you think it stays there? What what do you think happens on the volatility trade going forward from here? Because that's going to have a big impact on risk. Yes, but reality is right now we are normalized on what is, I do believe is a, is, a, is, a, is a good level, right, between 14 and 16. The VIX has been trading there now for quite some time. We did see the spike clearly on the 5th of August, uh, but I think the reaction of the market of the investors has been uh, pretty conducive to what I think is going to be a more stabilized market. The reality is that, you know, the impact of the rate cuts and all the speculation around the central banks, I do see it as already... Um, um, I don't want to say factoring into the volatility and the investors' uh, plays, but I do believe most of it is already being uh, included in their investment decision as of today. So I do expect some maybe short life trade uh, volatility spikes yeah. in the next weeks, but I do not expect uh, to be spikes like what we saw in August last, uh, this year. Silvia, great to catch up. Really fantastic to catch up. Thank you very much indeed. Silvia Vivano, uh, Head of Equity Capital Markets, joining us from Unicredit, Credit, Adam Milan. Interesting conversation. Inflation part of that central bank story, Critty? It's a really fascinating one, and, and, it, and it's having ripple effects. So people are still treading with caution. You're seeing that in the debt markets. We had that conversation yesterday, and now you're seeing it in the equity markets as well. But coming up, we're going to dive into that inflation story. French inflation easing to its lowest level in three years. We're going to dive into the economics behind it. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. This is the opening trade around 30 minutes in today's session. Seeing green on the screen, uh, some slight outperformers over in the French index is higher by four tenths of one percent, but still light volume, light liquidity. Stock 600, however, hitting a record high. We'll see how long that lasts. We still got a long weekend going in, in this, in the, into the states. I'm going to try to get my words right. And plenty of inflation data before the end of the trading session, Ollie. Yeah, and that record high being driven today by real estate up by 1.3 percent. It's kind of interesting in terms of the composition. But we also are hearing from the European Central Bank, Isabel Schnabel, speaking right now, saying that soft landing is more likely than a recession in the eurozone. So some positive messaging there, saying, though, that the 2 percent inflation target of the ECB will not really be reached uh, until the end of 2025. Um, and she will be speaking alongside some of the other uh, speakers of the ECB. We're going to hear from Kazakhs, from Ren, from Simkas, Mueller, all to join a panel later on today. So we're watching that very, very closely, particularly as we get inflation data from across the Eurozone. Yesterday in Germany, we got it a little bit weaker than anticipated. We got France in today, and we're going to get um, a little bit uh, more throughout the mornings. And you can see there are some of the estimates of what we are expecting there. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Imogen Bakra, who is the head of uh, economics and market strategy at NatWest Markets. So listen, I think that we can basically not talk about September. That seems to be a foregone conclusion, 25 basis point cut. I think the question is now, from what we hear from Schnabel, from Nagel, is the sort of how the debate is evolving over at the 
ECB. And for me, something that I think maybe is underrated, maybe you know you have a view on this, is that something has changed at the ECB since this inflation period, and that is that they've sort of amended a little bit their mandate, where they say now they're targeting around 2%, which leads a little bit more into sort of interpretation, particularly from the hawks and the doves. How do you see that debate evolving? Do you see that bearing on monetary policy going forward? Yeah, this was a shift that we kind of saw actually pre this big spike up in inflation that we had in the post-pandemic period, um, that we have this more flexibility, I suppose, around getting close to, but, but not quite at 2%, um, which does create an interesting dynamic between the hawks and the doves, what we have with the kind of schnabels of the world. And even actually from late last week at Jackson Hole is this more cautious approach, you know, we're getting back down to 2%, but we're not quite there yet. We're not sure when we will be there sustainably. And so we do need to be cautious about it. On the other side, you have the doves who are saying, look, you know, we, we might well be pretty close to 2% in this morning's print. Let's see. But all of the national prints that you mentioned so far suggest that we could be, you know, 2.1 maybe. Yeah. And if the hawks want, you know, 1.8 and the doves want 2.2, that, you know, is a material difference in terms of inflation and kind of where you set policy. It, it is a difference, especially when we think about the fact that core inflation is still quite sticky. So although you have headline coming off and trending back towards target more clearly, core inflation this morning is probably still going to print quite high. And that's what the hawks are really pointing to in terms of this more cautious approach. But I think generally, you know, when we think about the way that markets are interpreting the guidance, um, it's probably relatively fairly priced. Like you say, September feels nailed on now for a rate cut, 25 basis points. Um, and I think the inflation data that we get this morning and over the next couple of months will set the scene for an, one more additional rate cut uh, before the year is out. <laughs> So quite a bit less than the market is pricing right now. Well, the market is probably closer to 65-ish basis points this morning. So it's got those two rate cuts and then more or less 50-50 chance of an additional rate cut. That would imply back-to-back -back, you know, cuts at consecutive meetings. At this point, that's probably fair without more data in hand. Like I say, our base case is 50, but probably risks to that are skewed towards more easing rather than less easing. So I wouldn't push back significantly against what the market is pricing currently. Let's talk about the Bank of England for a moment. So the real surprise this month has been a, a bit of the bond market, the front end across Europe. Spain's down by 20 bips, Germany's down by 17 bips, the UK's up by 30 bips in terms of the yield. The Bank of England seems to be much more cautious than even the ECB, definitely the Fed. I, the, the, the contrast between Powell and, and Bailey at Jackson Hole I thought was really interesting. Are we reading that wrong? Is, is that caution justified? I think it is. When you think about what the Bank of England have been so concerned about over the last couple of months, you know, they've, they've really elevated service price inflation. They've elevated the importance of the tightness of the labor market, wage inflation. And when we look at the data in the UK, you know, service price inflation is still above 5%. Yep. Uh, we had a downside surprise last month, but that came off the back of a big upside surprise in previous months. So service price inflation above 5% is just not consistent with meeting that 2% inflation target on a lasting and sustainable basis. And that's what's really key here. It's not about meeting it in any one month. It's about meeting it on a sustained basis. And so, you know, when we think about the Federal Reserve and their dual mandate and the concerns that Chair Powell now has over the um, labor market with that rise in unemployment, it's a very different backdrop to what we're seeing in the UK, where actually last month unemployment fell. Um, so I think the caution is right, and I, I agree that actually the, the uh, contrast between what we heard from Chair Powell and Governor Bailey was, I think, the most interesting takeaway from Jackson Hole last week. So where does that ultimately take the Bank of England? How many rate cuts can we get? How long does this rate cut sort of cycle last? Is it going to be a rate cutting cycle? I think it is a rate cutting cycle. Well, I suppose it depends how we yeah. define a cycle, really. We've it's had three. Yeah, okay. So, okay, we think it's a rate cutting cycle then. We've already had one rate cut, don't forget, from the yeah. Bank of England. So they're a little bit further ahead from the Fed in that perspective. We think we probably get one more this year, uh, probably in November when we get the monetary policy report. Yep. And then that's perhaps followed up by a couple more in 2025. The market at the moment thinks we probably get down to somewhere like 3.7%. 
That feels low to me, especially when we consider part of the reason that UK rates have underperformed versus other countries um, over the last couple of weeks is this ongoing concern around the fiscal backdrop in the UK and what inflationary impact we might see from the wage rises that we've yeah. had agreed over the last couple of weeks. So market pricing feels a little bit low, but I think Governor Bailey's caution, particularly when compared to Chair Powell's relative dovishness, is probably warranted. You said my favorite word, which is the budget and fiscal and all those fun things. Um, the markets don't actually seem that concerned about it, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in Europe. And, and, and you see it in the FX markets, you see that in the bond markets. You even see that in the States. And this is a looming issue. But I'm curious, where's the dislocation here? How is that something that shows up in the markets? Yeah, I really think it's a risk that markets are actually underpricing. And probably in the UK specifically, as we head towards that October budget, I would expect this to become a much bigger market theme. Um, for yields to be much higher, probably curves be a little bit steeper. I know we've seen a big steepening trend already, uh, but for that to continue. Um, I think part of the reason we're seeing this being mispriced, in, in my view, in the UK, is that we've got a new government who are making a lot of noises around uh, potential tax rises, and the market's really buying into this kind of fiscal conservative narrative that they campaigned on in, in the election period. But the problem is this government have ruled out many you know, big tax rises and there is just this huge fiscal black hole that unfortunately isn't going to be able to be filled, we think, with tax rises alone. That is going to have to um, be filled in part by more borrowing and I think a lot more borrowing than, than the market is expecting right now. Put, put some numbers on that, though. Like, what, what are we talking about here? So CGNCR, the central government net cash requirement, the OBR projected that this year to be $140 billion um, for this fiscal year. We think that could rise in October to $180 billion. Um, so not an inconsequential um, upward revision. The risks to that number are probably skewed to the upside as well. Wow. I wouldn't be that surprised to see $200 billion, for example. You add on redemptions to that, that's a very big supply number for gilts this year. And that's relatively How sustained. How does that work with QT? So that's the other big question. Um, there's a question mark around how QT continues going forward. Yep. The Bank of England will vote in September. It's possible that they stop active sales, but I think everybody at least expects passive QT to continue, and that is still very high next year. Almost 90 billion of gilts will run off the balance sheet, regardless of what they do with active sales. But there's an even bigger question around what the bank, of, um, what the government, sorry, uh, do with those losses yeah. that the Bank of England is locking in. And I think that becomes actually the more interesting question than what happens to the pace of QT. You know, the government have committed yeah. to meeting these fiscal rules. And if they need to borrow much more, they might need to actually tweak what those fiscal rules are in order to, to stick to and, that and campaign manifesto. There's some discussions that maybe actually they're going to tax the banks harder and the justification for that banking tax levy will be maybe to mitigate some of those losses on the QT program. We'll, we'll see what the politics looks like. Imogen, thank you very much indeed. Imogen Bakra, Head of Economics and Market Strategy at NatWest Markets. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed. So let's say with the central bank story. Um, ECB's Oli Ren, Kazakh, Simkus, Muller, they're all up in Estonia. Simkus is speaking right now. Um, you can take a listen. I think you probably can also find this on your Bloomberg terminal as well. Let's listen in to what is being said in Tallinn. Very different story is about this recent inflation period when you, you, you mentioned already that we had more than 20 percent while the euro area was 10 percent inflation on average at the peak. But here what also matters, it's not only the, um, or what have mattered, not only the, so to say, uh, openness or uh, uh, exposure to the external shocks such as energy shocks, but also fiscal response. So in many countries, there were fiscal measures that were intended to diminish the inflation. So, for instance, decrease of VAT or, uh, or some other measures. While in Lithuania, the authorities uh, focused on keeping up the income of people. In a way, resulting in the same or working in the same way has to help people to, 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 to cover the increased in expenses but with a different uh, effect on the inflation itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Martin's please. <laughs> By a large degree. Uh, but, uh, but I think um, a couple of, of, of smaller points on this one as well is, but before I do that, thanks a lot for, for the invitation. It's a great event, and uh, I have a 
true pleasure of being here, and uh, I agree with your introductory uh, points uh, very much. So I hope we'll get back to the inflation forecasts and all those kind of things as well in this discussion. But about the different inflation rates, of course, uh, the nature of the shock and very much the energy and closeness to Russia was important for the Baltics to be more vulnerable. Okay? But there's yet another element, the way this shock is being transmitted, so the transmission mechanisms. And uh, what we see in the Baltics, that many of those are much, much quicker than in other European economies. For instance, uh, administratively regulated prices uh, that very much depend upon energy, in the Latvian case, uh, they by default are reset twice a year. So the external shock travels into the economy very quickly. There are countries where the fixed prices uh, time scale is years, not months. Okay? So that makes us different as well. Um, but of course, also when energy prices come down, it gets uh, priced out much quicker as well. And that's why the volatility in the Baltic economies for inflation has been very, very stark. Um, let me add one more thing. Of course, the time scale is important. Is it temporary? Is it permanent? If it is permanent, at the end of the day, it will cause problems. And that's why I think the fiscal policies are extremely important. Uh, how do they react? but I would say much more in terms of also structural policies. If European economy, if Euro area economy becomes much more aligned in its structure and its business cycle is increasingly aligned, then the shocks that will hit us are going to be much more symmetric across the Euro area. And then it would make life somewhat easier for monetary policy. But at the end of the day, it is also about structural policies. Okay, you cannot rely only on monetary policy to ensure that So that's the conversation going on among a number of ECB governing council members in Tallinn today. As we get European inflation data, we remind everybody that yesterday we got the numbers out of Germany and Spain coming in below what had been anticipated by the market, really bolstering that case for the ECB to continue on its easing path. Um, we will get the Eurozone figure a little later today and Italy. And guys, Italy, I think inflation's down at like 1%, something like that in, uh, in the Italian economy. Pretty remarkable when we're looking at, you know, two plus two percent across the rest of Europe. And also given the level of spending that's been going on yeah. there as well. Uh, obviously that did cause an inflation spike. That seems to have unwound. I think the discussion about the, the impact and the speed of policy is interesting here as well in as much as I think you're going to see very different reactions in various European economies. Sweden cutting rates, very short reaction time. Other economies yeah. in Europe are going to see potentially a much longer reaction time. And that's something that I think the ECB is going to find. It's going to be interesting for the ECB and others to judge that. And also, I think it's a story over in the States as well, the transmission of policy. They were talking about that at Jackson Hole. It absolutely is. And this is where the labor market gets really intertwined to that story. Because even though, and I think this is the, to your point about Italy as well, so even though you are seeing this fiscal spend show up, it's not showing up in the pockets of actual citizens. One, because of employment, and then second, because of wages as well. So you can spend into companies, into industry, into CapEx, et cetera, but that doesn't have a ripple effect or a wealth effect that you see um, in everyday citizens. Whereas in the States, it's a very different story where wage growth has kept up with that, and so has employment. So I think that's the, the difference. The, the interesting thing in the States is, did you hear what Dollar General had to say yesterday, talking about the impact that we're seeing in terms of the lower quartile earning brackets, and yeah. how, the, how they basically run out, and they're running on fumes now. Yeah. And that is, we've been talking about that kind of build-up, that fear that's been growing, and maybe you're starting to see sort of more concrete evidence of that beginning to emerge. Yeah. The upper end of the income bracket is still okay. So how do you balance those two factors out if you're the Fed? So it is. I see your dollar general. I'm going to raise you a Nordstrom simply because when Nordstrom results came out and we had this conversation about the kind of higher wealth, uh, wealthy yeah. uh, end consumer, it's driven Macy's sales, it's driven Nordstrom sales historically until this quarter where for Nordstrom, their beats didn't come from Nordstrom, it came from Nordstrom Rack. And I think that's a big... A difference yep. for our international audience that maybe hasn't been to a Nordstrom Rack, but basically they cater to that lower end consumer. They're saying that's where the growth is because even the wealthiest consumers are spending. Down. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. Yeah, well, we're going to take it next uh, from the Donner, Dollar General. We've just been in Tallinn. We're going to head to Paris next. And maybe actually Serbia, where Emmanuel Macron is going to sell some fighter jets, apparently. So we have to talk about that. We have to talk about the political story that's going on within France. Maybe we'll even touch Telegram. There is a lot happening in France, guys. And we'll get to all of that with our uh, Paris bureau chief next. This is Bloomberg.
my agenda includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries. For example, dealing with an issue like price gouging. What we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years. What we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. And I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. There should be consequence. We have laws that have to be followed and enforced that address and deal with people who cross our border illegally. And I think um, it would be to the benefit of the American public to have a member of my cabinet who was a Republican. We have to get a deal done. This war must end. In the meantime, and we must get a deal that is about getting the hostages out I've met with the families of the American hostages. Let's get the hostages out. Let's get the ceasefire done. Vice President Kamala Harris and Democratic nominee for the U.S. presidential election speaking to CNN in her first sit-down interview since becoming uh, the nominee and taking over uh, from Joe Biden in that race. One of the key pieces of that uh, kind of sound in the interview is the fact that she is actually thinking about including a Republican in her cabinet. Uh, that is a something new we've heard from the Harris campaign, certainly something we're going to be watching in terms of who those candidates might actually be. It's a similar story over uh, in Europe as well, specifically in Brussels. Today is the deadline for countries to send their picks for new EU Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen. Successful candidates will serve in the European Commission president's next mandate at the top of the EU's executive arm. Let's bring in Bloomberg Bureau Chief in Brussels, Kevin Whitelaw, to walk us through it. Kevin, what do we know about this process and who's being considered? Right. Well, so every country, every EU country needs to know nominate somebody or um, to, to be a commissioner. Um, almost all of them have submitted the names to to the commission president, Ursula von der Leyen. We're still waiting for the last three to do so. She's actually asked for two picks, one man, one woman from each country. All, essentially, nobody's done that. Um, and so one of her first challenges is going to be trying to figure out if there's any way for her to deliver on her um, promise to have a gender balanced uh, uh, commission. It's going to be an extremely complicated thing. Most countries want to say, hey, we get to pick who we send um, and, and uh, you're going to have to, to, to make that work. So her next job, once she gets all those names, is going to be figuring out which commissioner, which country gets which portfolio of, of all the different uh, 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 sort of commission roles. Good morning, Kevin. And you mentioned the sort of enormous complexity of that. There's also enormous complexity surrounding getting these Russian assets and getting that money monetized fully to Ukraine. We had the foreign minister in Brussels yesterday. What kind of reassurance is he getting there? There's some real anxiety growing that that footing, that that financing might not be on as firm footing as anticipated. Right. Well, the whole idea behind this is, of course, to essentially create a giant loan that's going to give the, the Ukrainians a, a more dependable and larger cash flow. And it's all sort of based off of using these profits from these frozen, frozen Russian assets to essentially guarantee that loan. This is supposed to be a G7 thing, and so it's supposed to be done in coordination in particular with the United States. But the U.S. has some reservations that are ongoing about sort of how durable the European sanctions regime is, sanctions sort of have to be renewed every six months. And so there's there's this tiny bit of legal uncertainty surrounding that. So the EU so far has really been unable to come up with uh, uh, an agreement to, to, to sort of change that. Anything requires unanimity and countries like Hungary have been, simply been blocking that. Um, but yesterday we did hear that uh, some of the EU are prepared to at least have the EU move ahead on its own. The idea there being that at least Ukraine would get a, a big chunk of it. And it would also be a, a signal to the United States that the EU trusts this regime and trusts that these uh, these uh, assets really are going to remain frozen for, for a very yep. long time. Kevin, thanks for the update. Really appreciate it. Kevin Whitelaw, um, Bloomberg's bureau chief, joining us out of Brussels. Um, we've got inflation data out of France, but politics is really the story that we're watching in Paris right now. Alan Katz, Bloomberg's Paris bureau chief, joining us now. Alan, I want to start with politics and I want to start with the idea that maybe Sunday we get a prime minister how how kind of optimistic are you? I mean, it's hard to be too optimistic. I mean, one day, it's true, absolutely, one day there will be a prime minister. Will that be soon? <laughs> I don't know. Last night uh, in Belgrade, uh, President, French President Emmanuel Macron said he was doing his best to get a prime minister. Of course, it's entirely up to him under the French Constitution. He has, he's held a whole series of what he's called consultations with various political parties and various other uh, leaders in France. Um, he's not come up with anything yet. 
There is some rumors that there might be an announcement on Sunday, but then again, there have been rumors that there would be an announcement every day all this week and nothing has happened. So the answer is yes, France one day will have a prime minister. Will that be this weekend? Uh, the reason it might be this weekend is that school starts on Monday morning in France. So it's sort of like the back to school moment, including perhaps for the government. Um, but we'll have to see. We really don't have any, any, uh, any sort of positive feedback on that yet. And, Alan, as we've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks, I'm wondering, does Macron's hand get stronger and stronger as time goes on here? Because it feels like they can't really get their uh, sort of act together on the left, and that he is sort of now rising in the polls. Does he become in a more po a powerful position? And can he spin this eventually as kind of a win? Well, possibly. So the, uh, in France, there's, th there's something called uh, the uh, stratégie de pourrissement, which means like sort of letting it rot. Um, and that appears to be, in part, what Macron might be doing. And, and you mentioned it uh, quite rightly that on the left there have been some rumblings, particularly within the Socialist Party, that they're unhappy sort of being allied with Jean-Luc Mélenchon and France Unbowed, sort of the far left part of this new popular front, this coalition on the left that was created for this election. Um, and so if Macron could sort of split that apart in some way, uh, maybe with a center-left, uh, you know, sort of, sort of non-political um, person as prime minister. Could he spin this as a win? It's possible. It's quite, still quite difficult for him. He really, his party lost a lot of seats in the election. It's very hard for him to come up with this yeah. as, as a real win for him. But, but your point is a good one, that that seems to be what he might be trying to do. Yeah. Well, Alan Katz, thank you so much on Macron's political acrobatics. Paris bureau chief joining us um, from Paris there. We're looking at the unemployment figures out of Germany. You know, unemployment unchanged in Germany, 6%, something we're watching ahead of these elections. We should say that 6% is the highest level of German unemployment since, I think, April of 2021. So relatively elevated in Germany. Is this something that feeds into the conversation this weekend? I think it certainly will. I mean, you look at the, the sort of jobs and the real anxiety that exists around the German economy. It has also hit it in the manufacturing, but a lot of it is just theoretical down the line. We feel like something bad is coming in, in Germany. We have these two elections in, uh, on Sunday in the eastern states, really expecting the AFD, the far right, to do quite well there. Thanks for joining us this week. It's been a great pleasure. It's been a great pleasure for me. Even got well. a shout out for your dad as well, which, is, right. which is a big win. Um, that wraps this show up. Uh, Anna's going to be back on Monday. I'll be back in Berlin. We'll wrap up those elections. The polls is next. This is Bloomberg.